Modular Open Systems Approach, or MOSA, and is chaired by my good friend, Mr. Jeff Langhout, Director of the DEVCOM Aviation and Missile Center at Redstone Arsenal. Are you ready? I'm ready. As I said in my uh, retirement party the other day, um, Ray Sellers, what a great guy. Awesome radio voice, awesome radio face. Thank you, Ray. Hey, super glad to be able to host uh, this great panel today. I just want to introduce the members really quick and let them um, get on and tell you the really great stuff that we're doing. So first up, um, Colonel Danielle Medallia, who is the uh, PM for Uncrewed uh, Aircraft Systems. Super glad for her to be doing this. Um, also, next we got um, Will Keegan. Thanks for being here, Will. Got to put my glasses on here, sorry about that. Uh, who is the uh, Chief Technical Officer. For, uh, Link's, for Link Software Technology, so thanks for being here, Will. And uh, hey, Dave, great to see you. Dave Walsh from uh, Perry Labs, Vice President of Engineering for Perry Labs. And then our great longtime friend, Dave Shrek from uh, Collins, uh, Vice President General Manager. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. And um, I think this is our second year to do this together. And then um, uh, Mike Shabru, thanks a lot for being here. Really appreciate uh, Vice President for uh, Product Management, driving the technology and business strategy for Wind Rivers. Um, Edge technology. So thank you very much for being here. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, like Mr. Lionel said, I am Danielle Medalla, and uh, Uncrewed Aircraft Systems is an exciting place to be right now. With the invasion of Ukraine, we have seen the role of UIS truly expand on the battlefield, and the capabilities of the UIS has just rapidly grown over time. Not only do we see UAS as an ISR capability, but we're also seeing the new lethality of impacts on the battlefield as well, as well as additional um, electronic warfare. Electronic warfare is very dynamic, it's changing, and watching what's going on in the UCOM AOR has really reinforced our commitment to MOSA across the UAS portfolio. So today I'm going to step through our MOSA forward acquisition strategies across our entire portfolio from small to large. And we'll begin with uh, the small. So a family of small UAS, our MOSA strategy actually began in 2018. In 2018, we separated the air vehicle from the controller. And we did that to get the most capability out of our air vehicle without being held back by software and controllers. So in 2021, uh, we began fielding the short-range reconnaissance um, aircraft. And what you see is about a 1.5-pound quadcopter. So when we began fielding that in 2021, because we had a MOSA forward strategy, we were immediately able to start developing new capabilities on Tranche 2. We actually are going to a, a test soldier test point here in uh, this coming fall. And what those new capabilities include are such items as uh, land nav-based uh, navigation so we could operate in a GPS denied environment as well as nighttime ground obstacle avoidance. All new capabilities so has the um, maneuver seated that's where we get our requirements from. So the infantry, infantry brigade combat teams identify new requirements. Our most of forward strategies in the family of smalls allow us to get after those new capabilities, integrate them faster and field them faster. Next up is uh, Group 3. So a lot of y'all have heard about launched effects. You might have known as air launched effects, the um, behaviors that are launched from both the ground and the air. And we got after that in a very different type novel way. So we competed payloads, uh, the mission system, the air vehicle, and the integrator all differently. Again, that MOSA piece. Are we going to say we're going to be MOSA? Well, let's get a variety of industry partners in there and, and see if we can make this happen. Uh, and what's interesting about launched effects is right now we're in the small prototyping phase that we'll field in um, 2025. But we haven't even begun to capture uh, the majority of our requirements document. Our most forward strategy will allow us to integrate new behaviors and effects as they mature, as well as a variety of new air vehicles, small and large. Also, in the same Group 3 space, we see future tactical UAS. Now, it's really important to note here, each one of our MOSA strategies is different. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So, F2UAS, unlike uh, launch effects, where we went to five industry partners, 
um, here we're competing five industry partners, and we're currently in that down select here. And what, what's different and novel in FTOS also is that we're using a model-based systems engineering. The proof is in the pudding when we say, is it really most compliant? So we uh, laid out our, uh, our profiles that we want an industry to follow, and we're going to verify it continuously throughout the competition. And we look forward to fielding that in 2025. And also when we field that in 2025, again, AMOSA is enabling us to get after additional requirements. As mission changes, as uh, new requirements are identified, we'll be able to include them on our FTOIS platform without going after a brand new air vehicle. We're gonna include them what we already have, getting away from those niche capabilities that quite frankly, the Army cannot sustain and that's a lot of training for our soldiers. Um, what's really different here is when we talk Gray Eagle. So Gray Eagle, as you all know, is already flying. It's an enduring capability. So our approach to MOSA has to be different. Uh, a lot of time is taken to uh, see what is it, the juice worth the squeeze when it comes to specific items of MOSA being integrated into the Gray Eagle. So specifically, we're getting a new avionics architecture um, system that allows us to reuse software that was already developed, matured, and fielded. And what we're seeing is that it is decreasing the, uh, the time it takes to identify the target. So accelerating that kill chain right there in the air, increasing mission effectiveness. Similarly, expeditionary ground equipment with a uh, gray goal as well. We know that our soldiers don't want to stay uh, in our uh, big shelters, huge logistical footprint that's just hard to move around. So what can we use um, to make it more expeditionary and from a software perspective, make it hardware agnostic. So you might have heard of the terms and you heard General McCurry mention it yesterday, scalable control interface and RAC2, which stands for Robotic Autonomous Command and Control. These are software. These are software programs in the PMUAS space. And the beauty behind these is that it's hardware agnostic. So we'll be, it's an open architecture. We're currently in the planning phase of these software pathways. And we're going to be competing in 2025 for execution. And once we go there, we'll be doing capability drops. We are required to do new capability drops annually. And what's awesome about this, not only is it going to, uh, to uh, control ground robots, but also up to Gray Eagles. You'll see this SCI software in our helicopters, FARA, FLARA. It'll be in the talk, it could be in the vehicle, it could be in the soldier's kit. So whether you're a viewer or a user, you, you'll be able to see all the UASs in your battle space. You could be able to see their video, or you can ask permission and employ the UASs in your battle space. Again, that open architecture and software will allow us to quickly insert new capabilities from your capability modules that we are getting after through novel contracting strategies uh, that we need from our vendors. Uh, again, just rapid inclusion of, um, of capability that we've got to get out to the field. So, so in short, uh, sorry, I, sh I just went through my whole thing. I apologize, gentlemen. Um, UAS, PM UAS is very committed to MOSA and everything we do, we know that the threat's changing um, and we just need to rapidly stay ahead of it. We want to increase our capability at the speed of innovation and how we're doing that is using that most forward approach. Thanks, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you, Will. Hello. Go to the next slide. And the next one. All right. So I'm here to talk about our operating system strategy. Um, it's called Mosaic. The, uh, the goal of Mosaic is to make a modular operating system. Uh, we want to make as many parts of an operating system that uh, have an uh, important part of an engineering process to be as standard and substitutable as possible. So, um, you know, traditional operating systems had been uh, coupled with tools where you have to build projects uh, with the same tools and everyone has to use the same tools. And we want to make great improvements where that's not necessarily true and find opportunities uh, to uh, accelerate the ability to build software uh, without compromising on robustness. Um, so, next slide. Just want to kind of characterize the environment that we're working with today and ho hopefully clarify where we're trying to focus on technically. So, as I said, um, typical integration uh, project has groups of engineers with the same set of tools. They build applications. We do have standards like FACE, which are great, um, help us get a conventional set of software APIs. However, a lot of the tools still have to be uh, used to build the actual binaries. And 
We're doing a lot of work, especially with the Mosa TO office, to help standardize a lot of those binary interfaces so that uh, the way applications can be built can actually be built with different tools. And they, there's a lot of, it goes both ways. You can build applications that can run on an operating system or swap out operating systems while preserving existing applications. Um, key areas that uh, there are big differences for us where we're kind of moving to our next generation concepts are swapping out the traditional way drivers are built. So if you go through the next slides and some highlights, um, drivers, uh, configuration interfaces, we find a lot of ways uh, to, to standardize these things, uh, promote their visibility so that they can be referenced in digital engineering tools. Um, we, we see that the, the next generation systems uh, built with a wide variety of tools. We don't want engineers to constantly have to change out their operating systems and, and the way they uh, prefer to develop software. Uh, we, we believe we also need to be investing in uh, more sophisticated uh, forms of automation. So instead of constantly rewriting software, we should be looking at algorithms on the way how to quickly come up with configurations uh, and evaluate systems. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, it's probably a good visualization that just gives um, a, a probably more detailed view of what we think operating systems will be looking like in the future. Uh, this aligns well too with some work we were doing with the VLC on trying to standardize profiles where uh, there's better clarity on key technologies like operating systems, hypervisors, where um, there's, a, there, there's always ways to actually conform to standards but, but change architectures that are, are better for robustness and for streamlining integration evaluation. So you're just looking at here um, a variety of our tools, hypervisors, operating systems, libraries that uh, are all configurable and substitutable. We see, the, uh, we see the ability to take applications that come from competitive operating system tools. We see the ability to take legacy software. Um, and uh, we, we need to continue to invest in the way to standardize the, the configuration of these systems so that uh, you could have um, a common set of tools that you don't have to keep uh, uh, swapping out when you're building systems and, and try to invest more in a, a consistent process. All right, and next slide. Yep. You can go to the next slide. We do have some real uh, world examples of uh, m making progress in MOSA. Uh, just the technologies, virtualization alone, that, that are included in our, our operating system tool set have already uh, made strides in being a lot, uh, giving us the ability to uh, integrate widely different uh, software components. So uh, we already have uh, fielded uh, technologies and that are in LRU form um, to uh, reuse different components, integrating uh, Linux environments with RTOS environments. Uh, we've even swapped uh, some of our hypervisor capabilities with other, other competitors' hypervisor capabilities while preserving our applications. Um, we need to continue to invest in these uh, concepts and refine them more where um, we can get more fine grain and get even more predictable systems and offer more variety in the way we integrate systems. I think that's my last slide. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dave. All right, next slide. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to start off with, uh, you know, a bit of an education session. So the five principles of MOSA, if you look at the guidance that's coming out from PU Aviation, you'll see this. Uh, General Barry has it on, uh, on the website, actually, that talks through, you know, enabling environment, modular design, key interfaces, open standards, and certify conformance. So the, the genesis of that requirement actually dates back until 2004 and an OSD program manager's guide. So that requirement of MOSA really started then and was codified in the NDAA as folks talk about MOSA and you look at, you know, how long that requirement's been coming and, and, the, and the standardization, it really gets back to these core principles. Um, so enable an environment, you're gonna spend some time on this, you know, how are we doing it? You can think of the what we're doing across the top and the how we're doing it across the bottom of the slide. The, what we're doing is that, you know, we started off with really coming alongside the Army and realizing that some of the requirements to actually go do practical examples of MOSA, you know, they need to be defined in a way that, you know, they're executable. So there's great things like enterprise architectures or the FAF if you're working with FEL or SEI for PMUAS that has these reference architectures that give you, you know, these functional blocks of, you know, uh, and concepts to be able to integrate against. but when you get to the lower level, uh, you know, the step beyond that, you start to get into things uh, called component spec models. And so, you know, what we did in, in collaboration actually with Mr. Will Keegan and then a smart guy that works for Dave Schreck, uh, Mark Brown, and then also in, in uh, partnership with the Mosa Transformation Office or the artists formerly known as the Mosa Transformation Office, whatever they're called now, um, 
you know, with SRD and, and Mr. Glenn Carter, uh, with Alan Hammond from PM AMSA, uh, we came along and, and wrote, you know, what is a mission critical operating environment or a safety critical operating environment or how do you get reuse in software? And doing that collaboratively under the Vertical Lift Consortium CRADA, you know, it sets a, a, sets a tone for, hey, this is a, a lower level requirement that that is how you build an AMCS, LRU1 or any other CFE box, you know, or, or two. Uh, and, and that's what we've taken to heart for any of our platforms. So from a software perspective, as we get into my slides, you know, that is a, a core principle that it doesn't matter if it's a box that's on Gray Eagle that's Com Express based and it's older and it, you know, and it predates a lot of these requirements the software is actually portable to all the new requirements that are now emerging. Same thing for microprocessors for a lot of the FTOS competitors, same software. So the portability is there, it's a container-based architecture and you're actually able to, to achieve, you know, not only the portability that you want, but you're able to carry the airworthiness artifacts with you, you know, and, and working with folks like Glenn Carter and uh, Scott Dennis. So. Uh, Another enabling environment thing, and then I'll speed through the rest of this pretty quickly, is you know, doing MOSA is, is as much as an organizational transformation as it is a technical. Um, and so what we've done is we've, we've reorganized. <laughs> we've uh, reorganized uh, uh, internally, uh, and we're awkward. Yep. Pyrotechnics? Yeah, yeah. That's Sorry, right. side effects. It was bad timing. <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> We've reorganized our company, so we actually, you know, have a, a, a group called the Solutions Group that uh, ensures that any product, any future development we do, actually implements that requirement. Because what we do is we provide, you know, software operating environments. Uh, we do digital systems integration. We provide hardware that all implement against that requirement. So any product that we develop follows that, and that ensures that we do that. The next three, uh, the next three. Uh, principles are really you can just walk over to the Army's booth and you'll have you know examples of our card inside of a Collins chassis you know us hosting both Collins software our software and many other third parties and so those are practical applications with the details laid out and then the last being how do you really know if something is most others you know certifying conformance so you know face provides things where you can do that from a standard perspective but you know, what we've done is we've actually integrated our digital engineering environment. We've developed that so you're actually getting verification that you followed you know, these MOSA architectures that are now government mandated so that we can you know, achieve them. Uh, next slide, please. So in graphical format, what does that all mean? So basically, the same software goes everywhere. So if you look at the bottom middle, uh, what uh, Colonel Medallia referenced in terms of that expeditionary GCS, Perry Labs does provide that. But we also provide that on our Stellar Relay. Uh, products on the left-hand side that are on UAS today in these non-standard form factors. And because it's the same software stack, because we've worked with people like Will and Dave Shrek's team and the Army, we're actually able to use that container-based architecture, um, you know, whether that's a unikernel on the safety critical side or containers, you're, you're able to get that reuse over to those 3U VPX-based programs, and that's what's in the Army's booth. Next slide, please. All right, so um, you know, stealing a phrase from uh, Tom von Eschenbach of "Go fast with few, go far with many," um, you know, or not. You know, today, if if you work with OEMs or you know, traditionally, you know, three, four, five year OFP release cycles to be able to get capability to the field, um, you know, what we've been able to do in the past with Project Convergence is over 200 integrations in those areas with all those customers or with all those partners. Uh, and so, you know, that's a starting point because of that same software architecture being container-based and aligning with the Army's requirement, we're actually able to carry things from Project Convergence and Edge into, you know, program of record things with ground modernization where we're able to come alongside partners like General Atomics, you know, who's relatively new to face and be a good steward from the ground side. Same thing, Tectonics and others. Uh, next slide. And so the culmination of that is well, that's UAS, how does that apply or how does that benefit, you know, the man fleet? How does that benefit the rest of PU Aviation and, and to get after MOSA? And really, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. So, again, following a collaborative government requirement that's on a ground system for a bunch of stuff that doesn't have the same airworthiness requirements, we're investing in going the extra mile uh, so that you can port it over. And it goes into Collins chassis and it's our card and it's our environment, but we're working and hosting. And, and actually, two weeks after uh, we, we submitted these slides two weeks ago, there's another company, Avolution, where we integrated 
radio control of a PRC-162 in less than two weeks. And it's because of that same architecture and, and collaborative nature. So that is what Perry Labs is doing in this space. Thank you, Dave. Dave, over to you. Okay, got the two days here. Hey, uh, you can go on the next chart, please. What I want to talk about, uh, but before I do that, is just thanks to everyone for being here. Because when I walked in this morning, I saw the outflow of suitcases heading out to the parking lot. I was wondering if we were going to be turning on lights here to operate the, the show. So, But this is an important topic. It's, it's one that, as you heard from everybody before me, there's been a lot going on, a lot of activity, both within industry and across the, the military. And that continued partnership is important. And that's going to be a theme in what you'll hear and what I'm going to talk about from how we play a role in that from a Collins perspective. So you look at what we're doing here on this chart and, and going left to right, really, we're showing on the left side. And I'm not going to talk about every one of those emblems on these charts. But on the left side really starts with this is what's really driving the requirement. Yeah, there's there's Title 10 U.S. code now, but the real objective, what we're trying to do from an open perspective is being able to have more efficient integrations. So dollars that are there in the budget can be used more effectively, more efficiently to be able to counter the threat that's out there that's growing, as a matter of fact, every day. And then also to be able to have solutions that can be, especially in particular on the mission side, that can be implemented and changed and pushed out to the field on a more frequent basis. Not every other year or every year or every six months, but every day, every week if needed for the warfighter. That's really the objective that we're trying to get to. How we're doing that, and I'll give big kudos to the Army for really driving the change, because to be able to set the standards, you had to be able to say, and, and PO Aviation, General Barry was very effective at telling his program directors, we're all going to use the standard. I, I, I retired from the Air Force. There were two or three efforts to do open systems that collapsed under their own weight because there was no one that said, you have to use the standard. Number one, we're going to develop the standard. Number two, you have to use the standard. Because if you don't use the standard, guess what? You don't have a standard. So that's, that's been very effective. And you look at the four lines effort there. FLARA, FARA, FUAS, and MOSA. The first three, I think, everyone identified with. That's kind of core you know, platforms. That's speed range payload for each of those different types of platforms. MOSA was really the new one. I think a lot of people questioned, self-included early on, is the Army really focused on making this change and making that a true line of effort? And I'll tell you what, again, kudos to the Army. The decision that was made in the GAO report, the redacted version that just came out, showed that MOSA is truly one of the decision points. It truly is one of those lines of effort. That was beyond a shadow of a doubt in terms of what everyone saw. If you aren't MOSA, you aren't going to be able to play on future platforms in the Army. On the right-hand side of the chart, what I'm trying to show there is, this is from a Collins perspective, we're making big investments in this area, but we're making big investments not only because of what the Army's doing with future vertical lift, it's also what the Army's doing with the Enduring Fleet, because guess what? That Enduring Fleet out there has to operate in the same environment, the same you know, Indo-Pacific environment, the same environment that we have with what's going on between Russia and Ukraine that the future vertical platforms do, and they need these capabilities too. How do we do it there? Also, what's included on there is how do we bring those capabilities to the Air Force, to the Navy? We just want a big program with E2D to upgrade the command and control prof, uh, platform for NAVAIR. It has open written all over it. And a lot of that work was done based on initial work that we did over the last eight to 10 years, starting with the US Army that's now starting to flow into the other services in a very big way for the same reasons. More efficient upgrades, and ability to be able to make those changes out to the field and drive them out to the field more rapidly. The other thing, I'll just take a quick pause here, but uh, on the four lines of effort and being challenged by the government, I'll, I'll hats off to Jeff, our moderator here, and congrats to him on a distinguished tour of uh, duty and a distinguished career, and his retirement was early this week, so he's in overtime right now. But thanks to you, because he was one of the first folks that really put a finger in our chest and asked us some hard questions about, okay, we we're bringing some of the marketing, bringing some of the, this is what we think we need to do. But he really questioned some of the basics, not only of industry, but also of what the government was doing. And that helped us all move along as a team down the road. I think it accelerated a lot of our path. And General Barry and his team was doing, were doing the same thing. Next chart. Now what I'm going to do is, and, and you can look at this and go, holy shit, Shrek's saying that it's a Collins-centric view of the world. All I'm showing is that, that Collins is one part of an ecosystem. 
And we're looking at it in terms of how we're making investments. So this is a chart that I use when I talk with my boss and try to get the investments that we need to make good on the solutions that you saw on the, on the prior chart. So what we're doing is we look at an iterative, and it's not only the technical solution, which we've talked about a lot here, it's also about the business case. Because what we're doing, and when I say we, not just Collins, we as a group, that's what we're doing, making the most of what we already have, that's the theme of the panel. What we need to do as we go forward is continue that teaming, continue that iterative process, because we're changing the way DOD acquires systems. You know, we, there's been a lot of talk in the past about, you know, you hear acquisition reform, and that's usually focused on how are we going to change the, the federal acquisition regs, things like that. That's important. But what we're getting at here and what makes me excited and makes our teams, our engineers and all the folks working this excited and working with the Dave Walsh's and his company and all the folks up here is what we're doing here actually changes the face of acquisition more than anything I've seen in the last two to three decades. And, and that's what's really exciting but we aren't quite there yet. We have to keep driving and get across the goal line. And what we're showing here is that you look on the upper left-hand corner, you see a lot of companies that aren't Collins. Those are third parties, we call them third parties, but those are our partners. Those are the partners and that's basically, you know, you have iPhones, uh, Android phones, that's basically the group of apps, if you will, that we're starting to collect up to ride on a backbone to bring those capabilities to the Army. You see some of the common you know, folks you'd see, you know, BAE system bringing aircraft survivability. We've done demonstrations with each one of these companies showing how you can quickly integrate in a month, usually two months or less, integrate significant capabilities that used to take two years, 10 million, 20 million dollars in the span of two months. That's what we're trying to do as a team, trying to get to that more efficient environment. You know, what we're doing with, and you heard a little bit from Dave already with Perry Labs, great partnership where Collins has a rich heritage pulling from our commercial side of our company in terms of how you do certifications, how you do airworthiness, how you make sure that flight critical safety things are done well. We're building some chassis and processors, assured multi-core, leveraging all the capabilities that are out there. And in partnership with Dave's company who's pulling in some of the mission and the mission processing that he talked to you about just a little bit ago and being able to apply that to some of the third-party apps that then ride that, like some of the General Atomics, some of the things that you heard the Colonel talk about earlier, that's what we're trying to build is that flexible backbone where you can really make those, what is it, eight companies turn into 800 companies. That's, that's what we're all after. That's how we're trying to change the face of what goes on and how we're trying to bring innovative concepts to the fleet that have never been brought before. And that's pretty exciting. You know, just to give you one one snippet, you know, I just heard recently from a coworker, you know, she was saying that, that her son was, eight-year-old son was taking a test. And there was a, it was basically a, had to, it was an English test, had to do some writing. So he had to write a two-page paper during the test. He talked into his Chromebook, which his, his mother was just like, how can you do, you know, you're supposed to type your test. But that is the group that is going to be flying FARA and FLARA platforms. That is the way they think. Everything that we have here, these are kind of the common apps that we think of today. Once we have open backbone, those companies and those capabilities are gonna explode. And that's really what we're all about, is how do we ripple that and how do we accelerate that as much as we possibly can. On the right-hand side, you see some of the, in the upper right and the, the far right, you see those, that's really our customer base. That's who's gonna use these systems. You look at the, the partnering that we've done from a Collins perspective, we're working with Kratas to make sure that we're taking some of our civil cert pedigree and, and helping with this is how you certify, make sure that whatever changes we make to a platform are airworthy. How do we do that? You know, providing some of our background and knowledge to be able to share that with the team. And again, that's not just us telling the Army this is how you need to do it. It's been very iterative in terms of this is what we need to do, this is what we need to do as a team. So we're going to continue all those partnerships. That's uh, what we're all about in terms of building the picture in the future. The one thing that I'll just, you know, my final thought, and th this is my last chart, but to, before I get off the stage is to highlight, you know, we've talked a ton about technical solutions up here today. And I'm going to hit on the top part, the business case. Because the business case rides not only on being able to build the right technical solution. I think right now we have a pretty good idea what the technical solution needs to be, given the, the body of work that's been done. We're, we're pulling together the teams and we're actually, we, we have kicked off some of the, uh, the activities to do those developments and move them along. The challenge that I see in front of us where there's been some work but we need to continue the work is in the business side of the case where there's this thing called IP rights and data rights. And that's one that we need to continue to mature how that's looked, 
how many data rights are required? Because really, what we're about, and here's one, I'll just give one example, and then we can all think about it and get together in groups to figure out how we're going to get to a little bit better place. In most of the requirements documents that we've seen, you're given an exception to be, you know, most cases you're supposed to provide your IP. If you're open, you can get an exception to that and be able to, to say that, okay, I don't have to provide my IP because I'm open. Isn't that backwards? If, if we have companies that are building open, why are they asking for an exception so they can be non-compliant to an RFP? We have to think about that as a group and figure out how we're, and, and I'm not saying this isn't a poke the government because you, government, have to figure it out. We as a team have to figure that out because it changes the way we look at IP too. Uh, you know, not just we, Collins, that we, everybody in industry. So I think that's one area that we need to continue to make turns on. We've made continued progress in that area too, but that's one that just as we finish the technical pieces, we also have to finish the, the, the other pieces. And, and that's where I'm, I'm always good for a sports analogy. So they... <laughs> So this is one where, and, and, and it really highlights to me why it's so important we work as a team. A bunch of years ago, early 80s, there, there was a, a East-West All-Star game. Some of the players on that team were, Eric Dickerson was a running back. Eric Dickerson, if you don't know him, his rookie year set an NFL uh, rushing uh, record still stands today. Two years after that, set a rushing record that still stands today for all time, over 2,000 yards. There were five linemen on that team, four of the linemen averaged a uh, total of 60 years in the NFL, two Hall of Famers. When they got together to play that game, you'd think, you know, this team is just gonna obliterate anybody. First two practices, the running game was not too sterling. Why was that? It was because Eric Dickerson got to a hole faster than any other back you'd seen. And I was one of the linemen, I was from Air Force, so I never played again another day in the NFL like the others did. But we had to adjust as a team. There were all-stars, there were Hall of Famers, there were people who were gonna play 20 years in the NFL, but we were not gonna be successful unless we worked together and figured that out. We're at a very similar place with what we're doing in MOSA. We got a lot of all-stars. You know, all the people up here are, are great in their individual areas. All the government folks that are working at government programs are great in their individual areas. We have to figure out how we get the timing down so that all these things come together at the same time, at the same place, and we get the great play that we expect. So, appreciate your attention. That's all I had. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Over to you, Mike. Thanks. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, next, again. So, I'm a business guy, so I'm going to try to give you our, the business aspect of things. And I want to look at MOSA. There's five things that are very important. The first one, as you probably know, this is obvious, we want to reduce vendor locking, right? We want to make sure that you can get the capability done and have another vendor swap the, it's pretty obvious, right? The second thing that we want to see established common operating environment. I work for a software company, so there's going to be a strong software bias in everything I say, so I just want to be careful here, right? The other thing, we want to be ab abstract from the hardware. I know it sounds silly, hardware is very bespoke, it has some features. We want to be able to swap the, sw the software just the same way you want to swap the hardware. One thing that I see across the world today is we have a lot of problem hiring talent. So we want to make sure we have the capabilities in the products that we are in order to enable MOSA that is aligned with the talent that's available today. It was mentioned just a few minutes ago about you know, an eight years old today using the product he or she is used today. By the time they get to do something, the environment that they need to use needs to be adapted to their thought process. When I was in college, we learned assembler. If I look at my daughter in college, they have no idea what that is. It's, it's like from another planet. So we need to align with what the engineers of today and in the future can do. I know it sounds silly, but it's extremely key. If we give them technology that's 20 years old, we'll have a hard time finding people who want to work on these programs. And five, we need to look at reducing cost of operation. In the world, across all industries, automotive, defense, industrial, medical, chemistry, oil, Everything is about cost of operation. It's extremely expensive to change software once it's in the field. So the question is, what do we do, and how can MOSA help, and how can we enable MOSA to go even further? So if you go to the next chart, there's five elements. So enabling, reducing vendor locking, it's obvious. We talk about face, we talk about open group, right? We look at A-ring for functional safety certification, DO-178C, et cetera. 
the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the Kronos Group for Graphics, right? There's all kinds of standards, IEEE for TSN. It is key to use open standards. Proprietary is interesting, but it doesn't scale. It never does. Everybody has tried it, it failed. And we have examples upon examples of our industries that have moved away from proprietary technologies to open technologies. The biggest one is the cell phone market. Everything in a telecom industry is completely disaggregated. The hardware is a commodity, the first layer of software is a commodity, the value is in the, in the application. We need to focus on enabling the value at the highest level of the application. Number two, I mentioned it, you try to provide common operating environment. You're looking at POSIX. You're looking at face conformance, 3.1, today's the latest one. But you also look at language standards. You want to be able to provide the right tool to, for the engineers. Virtualization is also key. That's what's brought up a little bit earlier. Why virtualization? Because you can disaggregate some of your software from the underlying hardware. You can remove a functionality, put a new one, because you plan for it. If you don't design today with that in mind, tomorrow you'll have to retrofit. And retrofitting is extremely expensive, especially in a flight, flying machine. Let's put it this way. And finally, to address the cost of managing your software, we want to look at containers. And I know containers are a concept that, in the mind of a lot of people, is an IT concept. That's not the case. The specification for containers are completely open, managed by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It tells you how to put software, how to put it together, how to take it from point A and move it to point B and make sure it all works. It never says it has to be for IT. It never says it's reserved for Amazon or Google. We need to leverage this technology that was, that was done, brought to us in a very intelligent fashion. We don't have to use it blindly, but we need to look into it. So if you move to the next forward. So the first thing about you looking at MOSA, and that's the first word, modular. Modularity is the opposite of where we are today. Um, if I look at the last 25 years I've done software, it's spaghetti everywhere. Every engineer thinks they're going to do the next thing. It's going to be great because I'm going to optimize it. But they don't think of it longer term. Once it's deployed, how do you change it? How do you update it? Amazon updates its software every 11.6 seconds in the field. I'm not saying we need to do that in a war machine, because that's maybe a little extreme. But it was mentioned earlier, it would be nice to update every two weeks. Or just pre before the mission, we get new intel. We can update the AI model. We can update some of the computing engines. That's where we want to go. So first step is going to modularize it. Make sure an application is independent to some extent of its surroundings. The second thing is make it a container. So you package it in a way that allows you to take it from point A to point B without having to rewrite anything. That's what containers were for. And I know I'm going to poke a little bit because I have Kubernetes on the bottom. And you say, what does Kubernetes have to do with an airframe? Well, we're not pretending you have to use Kubernetes in an airframe. That's not what we're saying. But Kubernetes gives you insights into your software. So think of an aircraft carrier. Think of a helicopter. Think of an airplane. How many compute units do you have? Hundreds. It would be nice to have a control plane that gives you that visibility into all the software. So you can easily update it. You can easily understand where you are. You can easily manage it. And then you can actually fight what I've heard some of our customers call fragile software. Because now you have the ability to potentially take some workloads and move them from a damaged system and run them in another one. That's what we're thinking about it, to enable a modular, completely open system architecture. All of these specific features are standard. This is not proprietary. This is not owned by Google. This is not owned by Amazon, nor is it owned by Winover or anybody on here. It's owned by the community. There's over 2,000 contributors to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So essentially, all the engineering brain power of the world has thought about how do I manage software efficiently at massive scales. There's billions of Kubernetes nodes today in the world, billions. So we probably can leverage some of that to manage hundreds or even hundreds of thousands. OK, next slide, please. So if we look at what Winover provides, as a software platform. We're a platform provider, right? On the left-hand side, you'll have the safety critical DO17C DALI certified environments. In the middle, you have the open source Linux, completely open. We don't own it. 
You don't own it, no one owns it. Everybody owns it, and we can all benefit from large scale and ease of use. And on the right-hand side, we'll look at virtualization, so you can mix and match. You can use our software, you can use Linux, you can use somebody else's RTOS, you can use your own RTOS, your own platform if you want. And if you press the clicker once, here's the beauty of containers in Kubernetes. You will use the exact same tools chain to manage all the applications, irrespective of the running environment. So your cost of operation will go down dramatically. You don't have to train people. They know how to use this thing. You can use the exact same infrastructure you use for your Salesforce, you use for your HR stuff, you use for your finance, right? These are completely open tools available in open source fashion or in proprietary fashion. You have the choice, so you can get support or support yourself. But no matter what operating environment you look at, you will use the exact same technologies. So mix that we face with POSIX and other standards like OpenGL, Vulkan for graphics, TSN for networking, right? all of this, mix all of that. Now you have standard application interfaces with standard packaging interfaces, with standard deployment interfaces, all of that being able to abstract away from the underlying hardware and underlying platforms. So anyways, next for you, please. So again, this is why we're looking at Kubernetes as the future. Again, do not take it as a, I'm gonna use and put Google or Amazon in my tank or in my aircraft. No, we're not there. But the reality is the, the tools and functionality provided by this infrastructure is actually mind-blowing today. It is being tested, not in the battlefield, but it's been tested on a carrier. Your cell phone calls work in Kubernetes. Every time you place a phone call, there's going to be a container somewhere that's going to handle it. Every time you try to book a flight, that's the thing. Every time you try to hoard a shampoo in Amazon, that's the same thing. So these are technologies that we know work well, and they work well, very well, at very large scale. So I know it's a little bit like I'm pushing the envelope, but as was mentioned earlier by Dave, right, we need to look at where we're going and how we're going to go way beyond where we are today. Because MOSI is today, but we want to make sure MOSI is also tomorrow. And there is a path to tomorrow. Thank you. Well, awesome. Thank you very much, everybody here. I just really had one question, and I wanted to give all of you all the opportunity to just chime in uh, quickly. We have about uh, a little less than 10 minutes. So as you're implementing, right, the whole goal of this panel was to hopefully demonstrate to this audience this is not just PowerPoint. We're actually implementing not talking about it, actually implementing. And I think, I think so thanks, great job for explaining where you're actually implementing. So we'll start, start with you, Michael. So where, where has it been the hardest? What, what has, what's been your biggest hassle of turning what sounds like a really good thing into reality and moving forward? What's, what's been the hard part? And same question for all of y'all. That's an interesting question. Um. The hardest part actually is to convince people that it's real. While we have a product today, no, it's true, right? We have the DVD. I can actually give you the DVD with all our software today. It's available today. But there is some reluctance to go for it because it goes against some of the instincts of engineering. We talked about IP, right? Oh, well, but if it's open, somebody's gonna steal my stuff. Or, well, but I, how, where, where do I put my secret sauce? So we see some form of a, a reluctance to adopt because in software, at least in software engineering, this is a very creative job. And the engineering is like, if everything is open, if everything is available for everyone, how do I differentiate myself, right? I, I put it out there and then next day somebody grabs it and fixes two things and claims it's better, right? So this is where we see the biggest, there's some kind of a, an inertia into how we do things today and convincing people that they have to change their mindset. You mentioned mindset a little bit earlier about the value is not in just doing something. It's you have to do it, but then you'll have to maintain it. You'll have to go forward, so don't worry about it. And then you'll, we'll have new requirements. Don't worry about it. If we give you more compute, we'll find ways to use it. There's always going to be there, right? When I started working in software, we had two kilobytes of RAM. Two kilobytes, not megabytes, kilobytes. Today, people look in terabytes, right? So. It's always about changing the mindset and convincing people that being open doesn't mean you can't innovate, doesn't mean you can't differentiate, and doesn't mean your solution is gonna be stolen right away. I, I, that's what we see mostly around all our customer base, if that makes sense. Thank you, Mike. How about it, Dave? 
I'll, I'll give it, and really my answer is very similar. It's the, the hardest part was getting people's minds wrapped around what is MOSA, what is open, because it is different. It's, it's a different business case. It's a different technical kind of approach over what uh, was done in the past. When we were going through our gate reviews internally, you had to do some previews with our senior leadership to talk to them about what is open. Because th there's always this question about, well, how, how do we make money at it? And it was interesting early on when we were doing some of the initial presentations and talking with Colonel Phillips and at the time Colonel 48, very early on in the, those two programs, FAR and FLARA, one of their questions which really tweaked my mind was, what's your business case? And I was just like, well, you aren't supposed to ask what our business case is. But they were asking it from perspective of sustainability, you know, because they understand and they understood then and they still understand now, if industry doesn't have a sustainable business case that lives on year after year after year, at some point it's going to start, there are threads that get pulled where investments don't get made and all of a sudden you have a dead and dying product that can't be supported anymore. And that puts you in a worse position than when you started the open path. So, I got it in spades. After they first asked the question, we started thinking, why are they asking that question? And we really dug in, and that was part of what we needed to do internally anyway, is how do you get your mind changed? One final piece, just to give you how significant and how long that takes, because industry is, you know, I, I, before I was kind of, you know, you could perceive me as poking a little bit at the government. Industry, we're rooted in the way we do things too. It took us, we, we had a strategic and financial plan, five-year view into the future that I presented for the last three years, four years, that was very detailed in terms of what we needed to do to be successful in the most arena and the open arena. And it was just the last year that, that our head person for strategy for all of avionics, not just military, but the business and regional and the commercial avionics pieces said, I think I get your strategy. And, and you know what was interesting was we'd already rippled it, as I said before, across the Air Force, the Navy, seeing that they're seeing some, some pull for that, some major pull. All of a sudden, our business and regional customers started saying, guess what? We want the same thing. Now, they're going to have a challenge in terms of they don't have an organization like the Army where they can say, this is our standard. But standards that we set can be taken off the shelf for them. So this is interesting where it's something where something developed in the military environment could very well play through into the commercial environment in a very big way. But it's taken years to get some of our, I'll call it corporate memory, kind of respun to, this is how you make business. This is how you make money in the future. This is how we sustain the warfighter in the future by building all those innovative apps and making those available to the warfighter at a moment's notice rather than something that takes two or three years and $25 million to integrate, which we just can't sustain anymore. So that's what the biggest part is just a new way of thinking. Awesome, thank you, Dave. How about it, Dave? Uh, I'd, I'd probably say it's threefold. It's, you know, it's the requirements, like most of requirements, most of conformance, and most of contracts. And so from a requirement perspective, uh, you know, is the requirement, as we all learn to apply in MBSC and other mediums, you know, is that requirement accurate? You know, everyone's learning and trying to capture and achieve the business objectives and breaking vendor lock and opening systems. You know, is the requirement itself accurate and are there opportunities to help the government get that requirement correct so they achieve their end state, their end goal that they're after? From a conformance, you know, once you have that requirement, how do you know if they actually achieved it? You know, the FLAR program is going to have a challenge. You know, Colonel Medallia is going to have plenty of litmus tests of, but what is conformance? You know, there's a line of effort that Matt Seip established for most of conformance, and there's efforts like OSVD that are occurring for PM FARA, but, you know, those are, you know, separate events that are being handled separately for the same goal to, to validate requirements. And so what does that look like across PO Aviation so that industry can have one requirement that's good, obviously not for a single weapon system, but one approach, and then a way to be able to prove conformance, and then the last being uh, contracts, which is we can have great technology, we could cut into many systems, uh, but you know, there's established OEMs, there's established IDIQs, and we have a capability that could get you know, capability into the warfighter's hands much faster, but those contracting opportunities aren't there as a small company unless you're, you know, unless you sub to a, a prime and you have to incentivize them to even do that because, you know, what's the business case for them? Um, so those are the, the three biggest challenges for us. Thanks for that. Will? So um, for us, uh, I think the, 
we looked at MOSA more from a technical perspective on how can we technically open as many interfaces as possi uh, possible. And so if you kind of walk through the thought process of finding all the vendor lock points of the product, um, it's very easy to find a lot of technical challenges where there might not even be standards for things that are blocking progress for folks to substitute pieces, integrate pre-existing work. Um, so we've been on the hunt to find as many standard specs as possible covering just basic configuration of stuff that goes in operating systems, uh, controls for them, having them aligned with uh, reference architectures like IMA. Um, and, and We've seen a lot of great progress, though, especially from the work, uh, the ACVIP work the Army's produced to help um, give us a, a vision of a digital engineering process that's also given us the ability to, to make our, our activities of standardizing, separating parts, uh, a, a reference point into uh, higher level processes that could help one day um, automate the way you interact with our products. So um, as much as there's tons of details, um, to, uh, to, to work on standardizing and, and, and calculate whether it's not uh, worth, worth separating. Um, we also, you know, greatly appreciate a North Star of, of, of uh, overarching standards that make our decisions easier, so. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Ma'am, over to you, last one. Sure, sir. So I think DOD and PUA Aviation's commitment to MOSA has fundamentally changed how we develop, test, and field weapon systems. Making that transition to uh, end items that were slow to change to end items that could rapidly and innovate with the speed of technology and what their industry partners have to offer, it's just hard. And you can see that we're hard, but we're, we've been having multiple panels the past few years. You've had most of the panels because it, it's difficult. So it's imperative that we keep up the communication amongst government and our industry partners. We've had, um, in PMUAS specifically, since 2006, we've had um, Interfaith Control Working Group. So today, that consists of over 400 industry partners and government partners. Having that collaborative approach moving forward, because we, we want feedback. And our MOSA approaches, just in the UAS, it's all different. All of our strategies to get after that MOSA piece is different. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and last, I would like to, to mention regarding about IP. The government doesn't necessarily want your special sauce. We just need to know enough. And we're defining what that ID, IP is before we even enter into competitions because we don't want to waste uh, industry time uh, as well as the government. It's a, it's a win-win by having those collaborative conversations re regarding IP and data rights right from the beginning. So, sir, I think it's hard, difficult because it's a, not a one-size-fits-all approach and how we develop and field. No, hey, man, thanks for that. And hey, thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. I mean, um, you know, mission accomplished from, from my perspective. Yeah, I'll, I'll just close with this. So I, I would put myself at the very top of the mountain in, in as far as uh, Chief Cynic when all of this stuff started. And, um, you know, because I'm old and I've just seen these kind of things. But I don't know how we can say that there hasn't been incredible progress made to achieving that vision um, and look, I'm, a, I'm just gonna throw it out. It takes a lot of people to make it go, but it took General Barry, in my opinion, to stand up in office and say incredibly bold things like, uh, we're not gonna spend any money unless we can ensure that we're heading towards open standards. And that, you know, it, it, hey, this country runs on money, right? It follow the money. And if it wasn't for your leadership, sir, I think we would still be having a lot of really interesting PowerPoint slides. And I, you know, I remember last year, um, you know, so besides being the chief cynic, then General Crosby asked me to host two panels, most of panels in a row. Thank you, General Crosby. But uh, I remember last year, General Barry, and I don't know, I'll give you the same opportunity if you'd like this year. As we were ending the panel, you stood up and made a couple of comments about, I cannot tell you how critical this is, and if you want to do work for PO Aviation, you're going to follow these rules. And um, you have absolutely put your money where your mouth was, is. And I just think we've got you know a minute and a half left. If you would like to say something to this group, because this progress, in my opinion, is largely due to your leadership, sir. So over to I didn't I didn't ask him this, but because he's the PEO, he can do this. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So Jeff, as ever, I appreciate that, and uh, oh, you you know what I will say, and it's the truth that it was a team. It's a team of, of many of the folks that are in the room here that have executed that. And it's always a pleasure to be with a team that takes, uh, even in some cases, uninformed 
intent, but it was clear intent that we had collectively to go execute this mission. And uh, I would agree, our chief cynic, there were a couple times I had offline conversations with my dear friend, Mr. Langhouten, said, please stop sharing your opinions uh, more broadly. <laughs> um, but I mean it when I say it is, this is a evolutionary thing. We are, it's not, we're not gonna write something, because we tend to do that in the Army. I'm a former uh, S3 plans at the brigade level, and there was nothing better than you wrote your plan, put a stamp on it, commander signed it, and you sent it to the unit, and you're like, okay, what's next, right? What's the next mission to come down the road? That's not what this is. It's going to be living documents. We're going to have approaches that require changes over time. And early on, I did say to try and force it would say things like, you either are going to change or you're gonna get left behind. I've been advised correctly by friends to kind of soften that because we do need, you heard it from our industry partners, we, we will not succeed even if we have the greatest strategy in the world, if at the end of it, we look up and we've got an awesome strategy and no one's there, make an investment to get after it. So it has to, it absolutely must include industry. But what we wanna do is, and we've heard it come out of the panel, easier said than done, we want to pay you for the work you have done and we want to pay you well and have you be able to communicate that to your boards so long as you have the greatest capability possible, and the second someone has a better capability, we want to very seamlessly have, be able to integrate that follow-on capability and keep the former leader, now incumbent, in the fight to want to fight to get back onto the platforms. And then have that in a way that we can affordably change that over time. So very easy to say, and you all, I think, understand the, the technical complexity of that, but I am certainly comforted uh, knowing that we've got the right folks both on our team and industry working it. And so the last two panels, I, have, I will say I have enjoyed as much as anything during my time as PEO to hear the feedback and hear the collaboration. It's not perfect, but we are on the right path. And I think we can all agree we can at least see the finish line. As long as you can see the finish line and you've got runners in the race, then we're in good shape. So I appreciate you all and thank you for your leadership, good sir. Giddy up. <laughs>